Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Valisher video seminar, The Battle for Generic Drug Quality, How Vulnerable Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Has Put American Consumers at Risk. Thank you for joining us. My name is Peter Propp, and I'm Director of Marketing for Valisher. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Joe Graydon. Joe is a pharmacologist who has dedicated his career to making drug information understandable to consumers. His best-selling book, The People's Pharmacy, was published in 1976 and led to a syndicated newspaper column, syndicated public radio show, and website. In 2006, Long Island University awarded him an honorary doctorate as one of the country's leading drug experts for the consumer. Thank you, Joe, for being with us here today. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. I am delighted to be your host for today's discussion with best-selling author and journalist, Catherine Eban and David Light, the CEO of Valashur. Our mission is to provide critical information about drugs and in important health issues for consumers here at the People's Pharmacy, and we've been tracking generic drug issues since the 1970s. In 2008, I was speaking with Catherine about the pervasive problems with drug variability, especially when those drugs are produced overseas, and we shared our growing concern about what this means for you and for other consumers. As Catherine was writing Bottle of Lies, she began to delve deeper into the story and the history behind the issues concerning drug quality and the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry. She discovered problems that we at the People's Pharmacy could not even have imagined, and we thought we had seen it all. We believe that her book, Bottle of Lies, is one of the most important books of this generation about the pharmaceutical industry, and she has shed a much needed light on a topic that has been ignored for far too long. We learned about Valisure in 2019 when the company began to document their scientific findings that supported our concerns, while also uncovering many more issues regarding drug stability, drug quality, and safety. David Light and his team at Valisur have become an important provider of scientific, scientific truth, and Valisur is a company that we at the People's Pharmacy regularly work with to help our readers understand how they can make more informed decisions about their health. David's recent testimony at a U.S. Senate Finance Committee hearing on pharmaceutical quality and safety is proof of the high esteem in which he and Valisur are held by the pharmacology and regulatory community. And now I'd like to turn the stage over to Catherine Eban. Um, Joe, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And to David and the folks at Valisher, thanks uh, for bringing me here. And to everybody who has uh, joined us on this uh, Zoom uh, webinar, let me um, uh, share my screen here. Uh, Okay, and we'll start from the beginning. Um, and there will be a little overlap with, uh, with what you just uh, said, Joe. But today I'm going to be talking about the journey, the reporting journey I had um, uh, pursuing Bottle of Lies, which took a decade of reporting on four continents, interviews with over 240 people, including numerous whistleblowers. Um, I obtained over 20,000 pages of internal FDA documents, which um, uh, are the most important findings are in the book, um, thousands of pages of internal corporate records, uh, and freedom of information requests as well. So as Joe mentioned, my reporting actually began with a phone call from him. Um, he contacted me in 2008 and said that he was hearing from listeners on his radio program that they were having problems with their generics. Um, he brought those complaints to the FDA and basically the message that he got back was it's probably psychosomatic because if people's pills look different, uh, then they think they behave differently in the body. He posed a question to me that I could not get out of my head and guided me through my entire reporting adventure 
and misadventures, uh, he asked me, what is wrong with the drugs? So um, I began to pursue that, and I began to look at the FDA's system for approving generic drugs. So right away, a couple of things jumped out at me, which is that you know, while many people think that generic drugs are identical, they're not actually. They are a version uh, of a brand name drug, uh, and they can uh, have a wide range, uh, a surprisingly wide range of absorption into the blood um, that differs from the brand name drug. They're supposed to fall within a range of not 25% above or 20% below below the absorption into the blood of the brand name drug um, under a statistical formula. Uh, in addition to that range, the medicine can have different ingredients, so different excipients. Uh, it can be absorbed at a different rate. Um, but there are some, some other things that really struck me, which is that the FDA reviews data that the companies submit to prove that the drugs are bioequivalent, but they don't actually test the drugs in any systematic way. Uh, and when I went down to the FDA, uh, back in the days when we got a little bit more access to our federal government officials, and sat around a conference table, and the head of the FDA's generic drug office said to me that the approval system requires the ethical behavior of the applicant. Otherwise, the whole house of cards will fall down, which just stunned me, uh, which basically meant that the FDA was regulating on an honor system. Um, so I came out with this initial story in 2009, which documented very much what Joe had told me. Patients were having problems with these drugs. Uh, doctors were having problems with these drugs, particularly um, doctors who prescribed what are called narrow therapeutic index drugs, where the dosing is critically important. Um, so once this story ran, I actually was not satisfied because it still didn't answer the question Joe had posed. What is wrong with the drugs? I had been able to document that something seemed to be wrong with the drugs, but what was it? And a month after that story ran, I got this email from a whistleblower inside of the generic drug industry uh, who called himself $4 refill, which is what you would pay to fill a generic prescription at a Walmart. Uh, and he had information for me. Um, the essential information was that if I really wanted to find out what was wrong with the drugs, I needed to look uh, principally where they're made, which is overseas. Um, today, the U.S. drug supply is about 90% generic, and the majority of that medicine is made overseas. About 40% of our finished generics are manufactured in India, and 80% of active ingredient in all our drugs, uh, brand or generic, are made overseas. Um, so this source was really redirecting me. Um, as I reported, I learned about a company called Rambaxi, which at the time was India's largest generic drug, uh, largest drug company. It was a generic company, um, uh, but also it was the fastest growing uh, generic drug company in the U.S. And this document shows kind of the stages of manufacturing for a generic drug. And I decided... Um, in order to figure out what was going on, I needed to learn everything I could about how to make a generic drug. So as you manufacture generics, you scale up the manufacturing. You start with um, small pilot batches in a laboratory. Those batches are often easy to control. Um, and then you scale up to exhibit batches and finally um, commercial batches where you move to the manufacturing floor, um, that manufacturing is a lot harder co to control. The drugs can become unstable. Um, and then that leads to an abbreviated new drug application, which you file with the FDA. Um, so trying it in, in my drive to be thorough, I figured I better go to a laboratory um, 
uh, and see how these drugs are tested and manufactured. So I called up Celsus Laboratories in New Jersey and I went there and the woman giving me the tour said, um, just sort of parenthetically, yes, we ban whiteout throughout the facility, which struck me as very odd. What does whiteout have to do with drug manufacturing? But it turned out, as I learned, that data is the essential cornerstone of good manufacturing practices, and it has to be preserved and unaltered um, and presented to FDA regulators. So um, whiteout was sort of uh, an invitation to cheat, and that's why they purged it from the facility. So um, after that, I learned something else interesting, which is in, in doing a uh, what I would like to say is a Bob Woodward, um, uh, which is to follow the money. Um, I learned that there had been an incentive, financial incentive that was baked into generic drug manufacturing, which is called first to file. Um, that any um, generic company that was first to file its drug application with the FDA, if they got approved, they would get six months of exclusivity on the market. And remarkably, that had led to this extraordinary scene at the FDA where companies would bring in limos and executives would take turns sleeping and waiting online. Uh, companies pitched tents in the parking lot in order to be first. And even fistfights and scuffles broke out on those lines so that somebody could be uh, you know, first by seconds or minutes. Um, it, all to get that six months of exclusivity, which was so lucrative that, for example, when Rembaxi got um, exclusivity, uh, first to file exclusivity for generic Lipitor, um, it made them $600, $600 million in six months. So if you wanted to be first in the parking lot, the question really was, how could you shorten the timeline that you had to go through to submit your generic drug application to the FDA? I learned that there was a federal investigation into whether Rambaxi was committing data fraud. And that data fraud uh, involved whether they were not doing the later, bigger batch testing and simply try taking the data from the pilot batches and making it look as though it, those were bigger batches, bigger commercial batches. Um, that reporting led me inside the Rambaxi boardroom where an internal investigation into data fraud in the company determined that more than 200 products in more than 40 countries had been filed with fake data, made up data in some cases just invented or that they would take brand name drugs and test those and represent the results as from generic drugs. Uh, their own generic drugs. Um, as I learned, the, um, the Rambaxi employee who put together that PowerPoint, which was shown to the board of directors, was this man, Dinesh Thakur, who is one of the lead characters or the lead character in my book. And um, after the PowerPoint was shown to the board of directors, he was forced out and started contacting regulators around the world. And he finally wrote this email to the head of the FDA, pleading with him to put a stop to the crimes that Rambaxi was committing. That led the FDA into an eight year criminal investigation. Um, so this is a Fortune article I published in May of 2013. Uh, so I was beginning to feel some satisfaction that I knew what was wrong with Rambaxi's drugs, but I didn't still have the answer to Joe's bigger question, which was what was wrong with generic drugs generally? And so of course the question was, was Rambaxi some outlier or was it just the tip of the iceberg? Well, how was business being done uh, inside the overseas manufacturing plants that make America's drugs? Um, and it wasn't long after I published that article that I was contacted by a new source. This person was an FDA consultant. Uh, and they basically said to me, thank you for focusing on this issue. Um, and the consultant called the issue 
fast drugs. So um, to take a step back, if you go shopping at the Gap or Old Navy and you buy a pair of pants and they're low in price, we all know why they're low in price, which is we assume that they're probably made in some sweatshop overseas um, uh, with you know poor working conditions and low quality fabric uh, and all kinds of tailoring shortcuts. And we sort of accept that bargain. But this consultant was saying the same thing is happening in uh, manufacturing plants overseas. There are essentially pharmaceutical sweatshops that are taking shortcuts that are substituting uh, better ingredients with poor quality ingredients. Um, and, and so basically from this uh, contact, I began looking more closely at those overseas plants. So I learned that even though the FDA is supposed to inspect those plants on the same schedule as US plants, the difference is when they go to an overseas plant, they often give those plants weeks or even months of advance notice that they're coming. Um, they will, and, and that gives those companies an opportunity to stage the inspections. Um, I learned that companies bring in data falsification teams in advance of the FDA's arrival and they'll alter documents or invent documents. Um, in one instance, Rambaxi actually operated a steam room where they'd invent documents and steam them overnight to make them look old, um, as though they'd been around uh, forever. And this advance notice I learned had a corrupting effect on the FDA inspectors who went overseas. Um, I learned about something called regulatory tourism, where uh, the FDA was actually asking the overseas plants to arrange ground transportation and hotels to issue a letter of invitation and essentially to function as hosts to arriving inspectors. What this meant is that those inspectors were being greeted um, with luxury vehicles at the airport. They were being booked into hotel suites where they were being upgraded and never saw a bill. Uh, trips to the Taj Mahal were being arranged in plants in India. Um, uh, and essentially what this had led to was an industry that was rife with fraud. Um, these manufacturing plants were making um, drugs without following good manufacturing practices, which are required but they were fraudulently making it appear as though they were following these essential guidelines and literally undercutting their own products for profit. Um, and even though they were supposed to represent transparently to the FDA inspectors, here's all the tests that we performed, they were running a secret testing operation um, in hidden laboratories to pre-screen the drugs figure out if they would pass and if they wouldn't pass um, to fake the data or change the parameters on the tests so that the drugs would pass. And then they would submit that fake data uh, to regulators. Here is an image uh, from a manufacturing plant in Mahali, India of a hidden laboratory where a company was doing secret testing. Um, and the FDA only learned about this um, secret facility uh, because of a whistleblower inside the plant. So in advance of the inspection, they had hid a uh, bulky appliance and put a bulky appliance in front of the door to try to block entry. Uh, and the FDA ultimately ended up kicking in the door and got access to this uh, spot where they were doing all kinds of secret advanced testing. Um, uh, so, you know, what is the problem with facilities that are not operating under GMP rules? You can see here, this is a snake in a sterile faci drug facility in India. And I am, a, you know, a big animal lover, but just not in a manufacturing plant. Um, and here is a, a blood pressure capsule that um, a retiree in New Jersey had gotten through Express Scripts mail order with a live bug 
uh, in it, which was wiggling. And uh, she was able to see it in time and not swallow it. So what has been the effect of all of this on, um, on American patients? The result has been that um, generic drugs with toxic impurities, unapproved ingredients, dangerous particulates, or that are not bioequivalent have reached American patients. And so one of the things that I know David is going to talk about today is how do we get beyond this honor system um, for these poorly inspected, poorly regulated manufacturing plants overseas. And his company, Valisure, has a you know, pioneering method of doing that, which is to actually test uh, the drugs before they are dispensed. Um, and you know, if, if we had a system in place uh, where there was actual verification and scrutiny uh, in a much wider way, uh, American patients would be really better protected from these terribly dangerous drugs. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to David Light. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. And uh, a, a perfect uh, introduction to, uh, to my slides here that I'm gonna now take back the screen. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I wanna start off with a little bit more of a, a background on, on Valisher and, and really exactly as Catherine introduced, you know, the core concept at Valisher is to independently analyze the chemistry inside of a medication before it gets to a patient and offer that, that transparency and that visible quality of assurance all the way to the patient, uh, also for doctors and for the whole healthcare ecosystem. And we, we originally launched this <clears throat> in, a, in a wide way uh, towards the end of last year with an online pharmacy. But we've been making a lot of progress on, on, on expanding that footprint within the healthcare system through wholesale, through certification of products, and even using the data itself as guidance for health systems. Uh, and on this slide here, you see a few uh, examples of all those uh, additional uh, elements of, of quality assurance in the healthcare system, where in the top left uh, is actually a website from a clinic in Pennsylvania, uh, where the clinic itself is getting wholesale a batch validated medications from Valisher uh, so that when they dispense to their own patients, it comes with that certificate of analysis and, and the doctors have that uh, quality assurance of what they're giving to their patients and uh, they're able to get it from their own pharmacy. Uh, we just announced uh, a partnership on, uh, with a company called Cabinet uh, that has a whole line of over-the-counter products. And so we are now certifying those directly with, with this a manufactured labeler of these products so that anywhere that they're sending their medications, uh, they're also getting this certificate. And really interesting paper came out uh, just a couple months ago and, and a link to it and, and its title is down there at the bottom on how to actually create drug quality scores uh, using a lot of the data that, that Valisher generates um, and boil that down into very simple guidance for healthcare systems, buyers, payers, and, and kind of throughout the healthcare ecosystem. <clears throat> and you know, the overall, you know, the reason that Valisher exists is that the pharmaceutical supply chain truly has tremendous, tremendous complexity. And a lot of opportunities for fraud, as, as Catherine has, has really underscored, and just so many uh, areas where things can go wrong. <clears throat> and you know, the patient is really at the end of all of this. Um, and in this schematic that you're seeing of the pharmaceutical supply chain is really just a, a simplification. Um, the drugs that, that people are getting uh, very often are passing through many, many different hands uh, travel thousands of miles and are often actually a couple years old by the time you get them. And if you think of a, a very straightforward analogy to that is used cars. <clears throat> I mean, obviously 
you wouldn't buy a used car without having you know, a Carfax report or, or hopefully getting a thousand point inspection. Uh, but yet all you know about your medications is, you know, there's a number printed on it and it came in an orange bottle. So certainly a lot uh, to be wanted here in terms of uh, additional quality assurance and testing. And the, the, the quality problems that come out are also rather complex. Uh, you know, Catherine had shown a, a slide about various blood pressure medications. Uh, the first one was called Valsartan uh, in 2018 that made some pretty big headlines for being contaminated with a carcinogenic impurity. And you're seeing this in, in the upper right corner, it's called NDMA. Uh, nitrosodimethylamine. And uh, this is actually one of the uh, most studied and, and potent carcinogens on the planet. Uh, as far back as 1977, there was the United States Senate hearings uh, about NDMA, uh, which is one of the most potent carcinogens known, uh, direct quoted from that hearing. And this was a hearing about medication quality. Um, so it's been a very well-known problem for a long time and is actually not even the only carcinogen that was found. Uh, when Valsher started looking into this, uh, specifically in Valsart, and we actually found a fourth major carcinogen called dimethylformamide or DMF, uh, which is also, according to the World Health Organization, a group 2A probable human carcinogen, the same category as NDMA and other nitrosamines. And the reason that I bring it up is uh, Novartis, uh, which makes the brand of Valsartan, also had some DMF in their product. So obviously we talk a lot about generics in an area where there's certainly a lot of problems, but you know, brand is, is not a guarantee either. Really, we should be independently checking every product that's out there. Um, and Novartis had a really interesting comment uh, to Bloomberg News uh, when this came out about DMF. And they said that they have uh, rules at Novartis that they don't use DMF. They don't even allow their suppliers to use DMF. But yet the suppliers of their suppliers may have actually used this solvent, uh, this uh, potentially carcinogenic solvent. Um, and it really just underscores uh, the immense vulnerability and complexity of this supply chain. And it was actually when we delved into it on, on DMF, it was most likely not the active pharmaceutical ingredient, which was identified as the problem in Valsartan, uh, but could have actually been the inactive ingredients uh, that, again, suppliers of suppliers and the whole in inactive ingredient chain is not even shown here on the simplification of a supply chain. And to, to get a little bit more into this, you know, quote unquote, inactive ingredients, um, this is a lot of what, uh, you know, especially when a patient gets a medication, realizes that there's differences. Uh, they look different. The active ingredient is supposed to be the same, but the inactive ingredients can be quite different. Uh, and here's another blood pressure medication, lisinopril, and you know, vastly different depending on the manufacturer and what was registered with the FDA. And uh, a really great quote from that paper that, that I referenced uh, before um, is that the premise that every innovator and generic product is of equal quality is demonstrably false. Uh, you can tell it's not true just by looking at them. Obviously, they're different and, and all the quality problems that we're seeing more and more, I think, underscore it from a scientific perspective. Uh, and as scientists continue to investigate this area, there's actually just some news made on, on some new uh, study that came out in science. There's actually been some studies along this uh, before, and this is an area that vouchers are also uh, currently investigating, that some of these inactive ingredients themselves uh, may not be entirely inert and may have effects on the body. And uh, one of the things that the inactive ingredients uh, are actually supposed to do uh, is control dissolution or how pills actually dissolve in the body. Uh, and this is something that uh, has been an issue and been discussed for, for quite a while as the focus of this particular article. And actually the way that I was familiar with Joe Graydon uh, before even reading Catherine's book was from his work on a, on a, a big time, on a very popular antidepressant called Wellbutrin uh, or uh, the generic bupropion that uh, was found to have very serious issues regarding the release of the drug, which again is related to the quote unquote inactive ingredients, but obviously very important for how the drug actually gets into your body and potentially for all sorts of effects of, of how a drug uh, interacts in the human body. 
Um, we've seen evidence of that uh, when we test at Valisher. We have obviously talked a lot about uh, carcinogens and, and uh, th that certainly is, is very concerning from the safety side, but we test a variety of different tests uh, on, on uh, medications. Uh, this was an example of some ibuprofen, you know, over-the-counter pain medication uh, that we analyzed where a particular batch was just extremely difficult to dissolve, uh, uh, very likely due to some issue with the inactive ingredients uh, in the formulation of this drug. Uh, we had batches that didn't dissolve for over 24 hours. Um, and you're seeing here just some pictures as it goes through the dissolution. Um, and uh, was certainly very concerning for us. And, and we obviously didn't dispense those batches in our pharmacy. Uh, this particular uh, kind of white paper that we created was actually uh, quoted specifically in, in a report to Congress uh, by the US-China Economic uh, Commission uh, in, in letters by uh, a number of senators. Uh, interestingly, uh, around the concern of these products being uh, largely made in China. Uh, a lot of these ingredients uh, come from China, both the inactive ingredients, the active ingredients, uh, which is all just kind of a, a growing amount of, of reasons that we really need independent testing. Um, not just the honor system, as, as Catherine has, has underscored, and it was this critical importance of independent testing, uh, which is why we were invited to speak before the United States Senate just a few months ago, uh, as, as Joe had mentioned. Um, and you know, what does this really mean at its core? You know, we, we like to, to talk and, and even define you know, this concept of independent testing as trying to answer the fundamental question of, is this a quality medication? And that's largely going by what industry and regulatory standards uh, suggest to test for, but occasionally goes beyond uh, and, and really trying to incorporate not just industry standard, which is largely set by the manufacturers themselves, um, but also academic and global in, insights, uh, what the World Health Organization is seeing, what the academic community is seeing. And that's certainly what we try to do at Falisher. And a few interesting examples of this uh, that really underscored from the independent testing side, uh, one of which is metformin, so the, the, the top diabetes medication uh, in the United States and largely in the world is, is metformin. And what you're seeing here again is the NDMA molecule. And what's highlighted is when you look at the metformin molecule, you actually have kind of half of this NDMA, the dimethylamine piece, uh, is actually present on the metformin molecule. And when we deep, did a deep analysis of uh, you know, dozens of different manufacturers that make this in the United States, we found a, a real uh, just uh, distribution of quality problems, uh, sometimes within manufacturers themselves, where they have some batches that failed, some batches that appeared totally clean, uh, some manufacturers that all batches failed, some manufacturers they all passed, and kind of everything in between, um, which is, is really a concerning uh, understatement of the complexity of this supply chain. And if you go back to that, uh, that uh, schematic of, of the chain, the fact that you, you have half of this carcinogen already on the drug may actually implicate not just the active pharmaceutical ingredients, but all the way back to the, uh, the fine chemicals that make those ingredients. The components themselves may have been contaminated uh, or potentially even a reaction with the inactive ingredients, uh, all areas that, that are being investigated now, uh, including uh, at Valisher. And if you look a little bit at the testing history of this drug, you know, we obviously uh, done a lot on that in 2020, but actually in 2015, uh, the FDA identified testing metformin as a high risk solid oral generic product uh, they looked at 11 different companies and tested it 13 times, uh, which was about a fifth of all the tests they did in 2015. So the, the FDA does do a few dozen on-market drug tests a year. Um, and, and in 2015, a fifth of those were just on metformin. But obviously, that, that's a tiny piece of all the drugs that come in. Uh, that's often what that we do at Valisher within a day or two. Um, but what is interesting is they, they already flagged metformin. Uh, they tested it again in 2016, uh, six different times uh, they tested metformin and all these FDA tests passed. 
Now, when we get into 2020, uh, the FDA tested again, now looking at seven different companies, uh, specifically looking at NDMA. And again, everything had passed. Um, however, when we did our independent testing, which also includes independent sources, so not just asking a manufacturer for a voluntary sample, but uh, getting samples direct from our own pharmacy, from, from distributors, from, from the actual supply chain of where Americans are going to be getting their drugs. Uh, we filed an FDA citizen petition showing that we had found many different manufacturers uh, with uh, NDMA contamination well above the acceptable limit. And now the FDA has requested recalls. And when you look at their list back from uh, the, the last four or five years, uh, a number of those companies that are today doing the recalls were exactly the companies tested uh, just a few years back. And another really interesting uh, uh, scenario and case study was ranitidine. Uh, it also goes by the brand Zantac that many people know it by. And now when you're looking again at the NDMA molecule, you actually have both pieces, uh, the DMA and the N essentially, on the drug itself, which when we tested it, uh, we found that it could create NDMA at extremely high levels. Uh, we informed the FDA of our initial findings in, in the summer of, of last year. Um, and then finally by September, they made an announcement of a contamination. Now what we were actually concerned about was, was not contamination in this scenario, but the fundamental instability of the drug itself. Um, and what was interesting is that only four days later, Canada didn't just look at a few lots and do a few recalls. Uh, they entirely banned the drug uh, throughout Canada. And 40 countries around the world followed soon afterwards. Uh, and then finally, in April of this year, uh, the FDA did request all ranitidine products, generic brand, to be taken off the market due to the fundamental instability of the drug itself. So, yeah, these quality problems can certainly be uh, quite nuanced and, and detailed. But when you look at the, the history of testing on ranitidine, um, which is a drug that was originally approved in Europe in 1981. So it's been around for almost 40 years. And if today, if you just do a Google Scholar search of ranitidine and nitrosyl dimethylamine, that contaminant, you find over 500 academic studies that specifically looked at this problem or investigated this problem in some way around ranitidine's connection to this carcinogen NDMA. Uh, if you look from the early 80s, just a few years after the drug came out, there was a number of studies looking at genotoxic effects, uh, unscheduled DNA synthesis, DNA damage, all sorts of concerns about the potential carcinogenic properties of ranitidine, uh, and its formation of NDMA. This was very clearly in the scientific community um, for, for decades. And actually, even in 2014, again, the FDA in their few dozen drug tests a year specifically flagged ranitidine and its uh, very similar uh, drug, nizatidine, due to quality issues such as discoloration and unknown impurities. Certainly very well known in the academic world what these impurities are, uh, but uh, this uh, certainly didn't raise the flags that it needed to raise. And actually every major drug that's had a recall uh, due to these impurities, due to, and it certainly made a lot of news as well, uh, metformin, ranitidine, uh, valsartan, the other uh, ARB medications, losartan, herbsartan that have had recalls have all been tested over the last few years uh, in this program, which is, identifying actually correctly some of these risky drugs. Um, however, all tests passed. Um, and I think this just really underscores just the, the absolutely critical nature and, and uh, need for an independent uh, chemical analysis that also incorporates certainly a lot of the academic community and, and has you know, the, the, the freedom and the need to go uh, beyond sometimes of what is just the industry standard. Um, and uh, with that, I'll uh, happy to, to send it back to Joe.